One of the best examples that illustrates a lot of the concepts we'll be talking about is maps. A map is a kind of model. We can learn a lot about models by asking what the difference is between a map and the territory that it's designed to represent, and what makes for a good map versus a bad map. Here is a satellite image of the territory that includes much of my hometown of Ottawa here in Canada. This image could function as a map for certain purposes, but without any labels, it's very limited. This image gives you some place name labels, some major highways, and the boundary between the province of Ontario and the province of Quebec that runs through the Ottawa River. Now, in this image, we've added a lot more information about roads and district names and boundaries. And now, with this map, we're abstracting away most of the satellite information. We've lost information about vegetation patterns and landforms, and we're just focusing on spatial relationships between place locations and road and highway information. Here's another example of this kind of map with street names and roads. Now, if I ask the question, is this a good map or a bad map? It should be clear that the only correct answer is, it depends. What does it depend on? It depends on how I want to use the map. What questions I want the map to answer for me. What information I want to get out of the map. If I want to know how to get from Kent and James to a bank in Argyle, this is a perfectly good map. If I want to know if there are good bicycle routes in this area, it's not a good map at all. There's no information about bicycle routes on the map. This map, on the other hand, has information about bicycle routes, so if that's my interest, it's a better map. Now this map has information about catch basins, uh, the places along roadways that have sewer grills. So if you're in charge of managing drainage and flooding in the city, this information is very useful. If you're just trying to get from A to B, it's not much use at all. This map shows regions of the city that are designated as heritage conservation sites. So if you're involved in urban planning or you're looking to buy property, uh, this may be useful for you. If you're into orienteering, you need a different kind of map. Orienteering is where you use a map and a compass to navigate on foot from point to point across terrain that's usually unfamiliar to you. And the goal is to hit all your targets in the shortest time. You need detailed information about the terrain to do this. So the map includes information about contours and landforms and rock features and waterways and buildings and walls and fences and out of bounds areas and so on. So what counts as a good map for orienteering purposes is obviously going to be very different from what counts as a good map for city driving purposes. So these are all different maps of the same chunk of physical reality. Each of them abstracts away almost all of the observable features of this chunk of reality and represents only a small set of features. But this abstraction is precisely what makes these maps useful. If we tried to pay attention to everything all at once, it would be overwhelming. We couldn't do it. So to answer questions about this chunk of reality, we create maps that depict only those features that are relevant to the specific questions that we want answers for. So that is the first point I want to make. Maps abstract from our experience. What does that mean? It means that they represent only certain aspects of reality and they ignore the rest. They radically simplify reality. Why do we do this? Because we need to simplify reality in order to focus attention on the features that are relevant to our interests. This leads to the second point. Maps are tools for reasoning about the world. They're tools for drawing inferences. What kind of inferences? Inferences about the features that we care about. If what I care about is a way of navigating from one street location to another street location, then a street map is a tool for doing this. By looking at the map and reasoning about features of the map, I can draw conclusions about features of the city. Let's break down the steps in this reasoning. We create a map of the city with only the features we care about for navigation. In this case, spatial relationships and place locations. We ignore all the rest. Our goal is to pick the right features so that by reasoning about the features of the map, we can draw conclusions about features of the city, like how to get from Kent and James to Bank in Argyle. 
So it looks like this. I identify my two locations on the map. I then use the spatial relationships depicted in the map to reason about the most efficient way of navigating from one location to the other. And all of this is done by looking at the map, not at the city itself. I use this information to infer a conclusion about the most efficient way to navigate in the city. The map is a tool for reasoning and drawing conclusions about the city. The map stands in for the city in our reasoning about the city. Now, this reasoning relies on the assumption that the shared features of the map in the city that we've used to construct the map captures the information we need to draw reliable inferences about the city. If it does, if our reasoning is successful, then we say, for these purposes, this is a good map of the city. Now, note that this down arrow that I've drawn on the right that relates features of the city to features of the city is different from the arrow on the left side. In this diagram, I'm using the solved arrow to represent a relation of inference. It's a bit of logical reasoning. We're not reasoning about the features of the city directly. That's why it's a dotted arrow. We're reasoning about features of the map and using that as a proxy, as a substitute for reasoning about features of the city. And here is the upshot for our discussion of models, as I'm sure you've guessed. What I've just described is the modeling relation. This is what it means to say that one thing is a model of another thing. This is how models in science work. It's not just the claim that two systems are similar in some respect. What matters is that in virtue of the similarity, we can reason about one system in a way that allows us to draw inferences about the other system. You need the reasoning part to understand what it means for each of these maps to be a different model of the same city and what it means for each of these maps to be a good or bad model of the city. Now, if we jump back to our mapping diagram and just substitute the word model for map and world for city, then we have a general description of what it means for something to be a model. A model in science is something that plays this role in our reasoning about the world. 